This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man on State of Day here in Hawaii. The 18th of August is uh, the date that Hawaii in 1959 became a state. So happy statehood day and I uh, hope everybody's out there at the beach and not working. If you have to work, sorry about that. But uh, we're, I'm off today. I'm going to go to the beach after this, I think. Anyway, this week we have uh, got uh, Ryan Wubbins from Burnson McDonald again. I'm, I'm going to have him as a regular guest because he's my favorite electrical engineer. And uh, we get to talk more technical stuff about things that uh, may impact you. Um, and what I'd like to do is start off today's show by talking about an event that I went to yesterday with um, Rachel James from our office. And it was sponsored by Hawaiian Electric and it's, uh, it's been going on for several years and I don't remember the exact name of the event, so I'm sorry I should have brought this stuff with me. But um, it was a sustainable housing and um, uh, event that brought in stakeholders. There were architects there, there were builders, there were uh, folks who put up solar, uh, state entities, um, the new director of the uh, state energy office was there with a lot of her staff. Uh, Eugene uh, from DBED, our, our main economist in DBED was there to talk about the economic implications of housing in the state across the board, all kinds, apartments and everything. And we basically just uh, talked a lot about um, uh, the imp impact of renewable energy uh, as we move forward towards more, more and more renewable energy on the grid and also some of the um, projects that have been going on in um, energy efficiency and also in what we kind of term now tiny homes which it's not like where you put leprechauns and stuff from Minahuni it's it's actually um, an architectural trend across the continental United States where um, folks that want to have a home but don't have the capital maybe they're paying off their school loans or whatever they get into these three and four hundred square foot homes. Some are on wheels, some are temporarily on wheels, and they can be put on a slab. Um, but they're basically three or four hundred square feet, and that's the whole house: kitchen, bathroom, shower, bedroom, and it's almost like living on a boat, except you're on land. Um, in fact, that's a pretty good analogy. It's a lot like living on a boat. Um, every square inch of space is used. Under the stairs is storage or shelves or or drawers or something. So. Everything is accounted for, every square inch that, you, that you've got. But they make these things very efficient, energy efficient, and um, they're, they're really kind of a neat model. So we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about not only the tiny homes and the implications of uh, saving energy, um, but we had one presenter from the Big Island um, who was helping the, uh, the low-income folks that live, say, around Mililii, around south, south of Kona on the Big Island, who are already so far off the uh, county system that they're on catchment water and uh, quite often off the grid. And there were cases where some of those folks were so far off the grid, they basically had to drive somewhere every two days to get enough ice to throw in their coolers to keep their fu food cool. And their water catchment systems were so old that they had to go and buy bottled water to have drinking water. And so she was help, uh, explaining how she got some USDA grants to help these folks get some PV on the roof and establish some uh, portable solar and some fixed solar on the roof to get them freezers or to get them enough of a water purification system that they can at least have drinking water coming out of the tap, which is something they never had before. So today's discussion, we're going to kind of start there. And with the premise being, you know, electric grids are pretty complicated things and Ryan understands all about those. But when you start to roll that back and get to a simpler and simpler mode. Is there like a sweet spot that, that certain communities can take advantage of where being off the grid maybe isn't such a bad thing? Uh, I think some people want to be off the grid. Other folks have to be off the grid. And a lot of folks could be off the grid, but they're lazy. They don't want to, they don't want to have to understand anything. They just want to flip a switch on and pay Pico for the power. But there's probably technically uh, a really good um, range in there where people could come off the grid, and, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, Ryan, welcome today. Good Thank to you. see you again. Yeah. Uh, did, I hear, uh, did I climb my way up the electrical engineer list of yes. Stan's yes, favorite you have. electrical engineers? That's, you, I've you, been trying on those. You're at the pinnacle. Yeah. Man, Congratulations. So long. You can go home and crack a bottle <laughs> of champagne over yeah. that one or something. All right. But thanks. But you, you know, you heard me, my entry there. What do you think? Can, can, when we have these little tiny homes, 
they're they're pretty basic and they're pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that's beyond the reach of the average person to set up their own uh, off the grid kind of system in a in a small home or even a medium sized home? Yeah, absolutely. So the best thing about a, a tiny home or a small home, let's kind of lump those two together because you might have a tiny home, which we kind of think maybe that's on wheels and that's RV like house. Right, that RV like size anyway, yeah. Yeah, and then sometimes let's just go to, to small homes and kind of lump them into. I live in a house less than 100,000 square feet. Um, it's not that big, it's a few bedrooms in the, sure. in the living room. Uh, the best thing about these houses and, and getting yourself to possibly be off grid is they're just simple and they, in being smaller, they're much more efficient because you're managing your living space to be less. You're gonna need less light just to hit your mm -hmm. floors and, and your ceilings. You're gonna need less airflow. If you have a fan, you, you have one instead of three. Maybe you don't even have AC uh, being here and you, you probably don't, you might not need it. Even if you do, it's going to be smaller. Uh, as you see, the air conditioners are sized for square footage. Um, you're consuming less load. The, the less load you're going to consume, the much easier it's going to be for you to become off grid. Um, that's the best part about them, as in that aspect. Um, there'll be some other aspects that are a little bit harder on you know, how technically involved is it do I want to be in my system? You know, how energy efficient do I want to be in my system? And there's some different ways to, to help manage that, where it doesn't always have to be just you. We can start grouping some houses together, and then either that community goes after a way to, to work on this together, um, or the utility comes in to, and helps provide that service. Okay. So one of the things that you got to consider is, if, especially if you're using solar, is do you get sunlight? I mean, certain communities, you're up against the mountain, um, you don't really get the morning light, and by the afternoon, the mountains blocking the afternoon light, like on the windward coast, maybe in Kahalu and stuff, it, it could be kind of tough. Um, what are some of the some of the things that you want to consider when you start thinking about solar first? I mean, w be, besides the sun being there, um, sure. like how big the system, it, like say for example, you knew that you used in a small house, maybe 15 kilowatt hours a day. So, and you know, what are some of the, the things you'd consider in sizing your system, how many PV panels and how much battery and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the big numbers are gonna be what's your peak load, what's your kilowatts, you know, how much kilowatts you end up using at a, at a certain instant, instant in time. time. Mm -hmm. yep. And then how many kilowatt hours are you using, let's say over the course of a day, a right. week, a month. Let's um, stop there and explain something. Mm -hmm. So the peak kilowatts are like the worst case scenario appliance that you turn on and it puts a big load on your system. Yep. for a few seconds or a second yep and and that's the peak load that's the peak load and then the average load or the total load of the day is over the whole day how many kilowatt hours because when you get your bill from Hawaiian electric it bills you in kilowatt hours yep. but what most people don't see is their house is set up for 50 amps or their their size for a certain load and that's kind of transparent to most people so the two big considerations are the max load you ever put on your system at one time and then the amount of energy you need all day long, correct? Yep, absolutely. Okay. And that it's not going to be an average of mm -hmm. that bill that you receive from the utility that says, okay, I, I was an average of this many kilowatt hours. That's my kilowatts. When you turn on your washer, your dryer, um, your microwave, that's just going to drive up little peaks. But when you want to come off the grid, you got to be ready to, to supply the energy for those peaks. Um, if it's solar, can't just ask the solar, hey, I need a little bit more, just give it to me right now, because solar is just, I'm taking on the sun and I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you what I got when I can. You can do a little things with the, with the solar, but it, you're still limited. You gotta right. ask something else there can to, only give to, you so to start much. managing. Yeah. Yep. So that's where we start talking about an energy storage device to really go off the grid. Or you just, some loads are gonna, oh, I don't wanna say suffer, but they might drop out for a little bit right. as you give a little bit of power to your your dryer to, to start up, mm -hmm. maybe, if you, if you have something like that. So, um, you got two options there. You either kind of build a little bit more energy storage or solar than you really need um, for future growth or for um, maybe heavier loads than, than the average person. Or, you get real Akamai, real smart about, you know, when you tr do your laundry, like, you on purpose don't do your laundry while you're trying to cook something in the electric oven or electric stove and run your 
your skill saw and you know turn on all your lights and your fans you you basically have to be thinking more as a as an individual what you're doing to your grid is that pretty, yep pretty fair? that's exactly it. and sometimes you're already experiencing this if you're in your garage and you're and you're building a boat or something you you got your power tools running and you know maybe maybe the dishwasher or something's going at the same time and you just keep hitting trip because you're doing so much at once you're already naturally oh let me turn this off and mm -hmm. go over here it's something we're already doing in some cases but not not instinctively all the time and that would change if you're going to build your system to be really efficient really really tight you're going to be you're already be built for that mentally to just mm -hmm. okay let's turn my washing machine on right now i'm using the dryer instead of this i'm using this and yeah, you'll build that in. Yeah, what are the advantages? You know, I know as a general rule, we go for efficiency first, so we try and build an efficient system before we put PV on. You don't just throw PV on the roof and then decide to figure out whether you can save energy. It's, uh, you might as well put in the right amount of solar and batteries and things. Um, but one of the big um, energy hogs, I would call it, in your house is a water heater, especially if you have an electric water heater. Mm -hmm. So. Um, is, is putting a solar water heater on your house, you know, pretty simple or is it complex or is it, I mean, is it something that you would consider an energy efficiency move before you go put PV on your roof for electricity? Yeah, I, the nice thing about a solar water heater, they work really well. I mean, they, they're capturing as much sunlight as they can, um, even in, in a little bit of a cloudy situation, but they're not affecting Let's say the utility, like a solar would. When you go mm -hmm. to solar now, you're going to have to start asking the utility or you're going to have to start permitting that because you're tying into a bigger system. Mm -hmm. So the solar water heater, they're, they're relatively simple in how they work. They're not as simple as an electric water heater, but uh, it, they have great payback. And mm -hmm. I, would, I would recommend installing them wherever you can. So you're Absolutely. kind of doing your own net metering. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. um, how about those instant on kind of heaters, gas or electric? Are they... Would they do a similar trick? Would they actually help you out? Yep, they are going to help you out as far as an energy efficiency because your electric water heater or even your solar, it's holding a tank of warm water on the side. And you're always keeping it warm in case you need to start using it. Uh, you can't just flip it on and say, I'm going to use it because it's going to take time to heat that water up just like you boil mm -hmm. a tank of water on your stove. So um, an instant water heater is basically just saying, hey, you want hot water now? I'm just going to hit it really hot. And you're only using what you need at that time. Mm -hmm. So they, they are a more heat efficient. exchanger, right? It's, mm -hmm. So you've got a bunch of coil, like a bunch of coils wrapped around a heat source, and it's got so much volume of water in it. And by the time it goes from start to out, it's heating up the whole way. So mm -hmm. it, it's pretty much it's on-demand water heating. Yep. The thing to think about that, if you're going to go electric on those, uh, they draw more current right. when they're heating the water up because they they need to heat the water up really fast, fast. as compared to water heater. It's just Keeping so that's one of those surge components that you talk about. Yep. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, we'll be back with Ryan Woodmans in about 60 seconds. Talk more about not only uh, designing these systems, but maybe some of the permitting issues that, that come into play when you start uh, doing things like putting PV on your roof. Or in Ryan's case, he does a lot of industrial lot size or commercial size uh, work and what the impacts are for him. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Ted Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you.
Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man, but not on my lunch hour today. We're on my day off, so I'm glad to be here on Think Tech, and it's always fun, especially fun talking to Ryan. He's, like I say, he's my, my favorite electrical engineer on the entire planet, and uh, it's good chatting with him because I get so smart when I, when I talk to him, and uh, it makes me feel more comfortable when I do my job. So thanks for being here, Ryan. And uh, we kind of left off talking about some solar and, and, so, and solar water heating and things like that. But I wanted to switch gears just a little bit and talk a little bit about permitting too, because we work on projects together for the military and it's no longer a lot of times just a building permit. And, and some of the issues we talked about yesterday with uh, in that um, su sustainable housing thing was how some of the, even the county permitting for these tiny homes was almost restrictive or prohibitive because it was designed for bigger dwellings or bigger um, uh, facilities. And, and the permitting actually stopped people from doing some of the things that were fairly common sense and simple for a smaller home. And so some of the initiatives we talked about yesterday were getting the county and uh, maybe some of the state agencies to change their policies or change their rules on permitting. But what are some of the things on your scale, on the commercial scale, industrial scale, some of the kinds of permits that you always end up having to look at for environmental, for health, for uh, building, things like mm -hmm. that. Sure. So permitting on a, on a larger scale, something much more industrial, will have some correlations to permitting uh, a series of tiny homes or smaller houses. And, it, and the correlation comes with basically how much changes to the infrastructure you're making within an area. So in a tiny home, you think, I'm just dropping a little house. I'm not really causing any problem. Let's look at it on the, on the industrial scale. Some common questions would be, how am I affecting the stormwater system? What, what am I putting in place here that's going to redirect water when it rains? Okay, we get plenty of rain here. That is something that, that you need to be actively aware of all the time. It's not even what there is a storm. If it happens, you got to be ready for it. Um, wastewater treatment. Where, what water am I consuming? Is it ready for me to take? And what am I going to do with it when I'm done with it? And uh, electrically, I need X amount of load. Uh, maybe I'm gonna, I want to have some solar. What am I going to do to that electrical utility? The permitting process it will apply to all of those and, and a lot more, especially with, with environmental and uh, carbon emission type on the industrial side. But let's just focus on like a wastewater Wastewater, I think, is going to be easy to, to explain. When we add a bunch of tiny homes within an area, you say, why can't I just put in my house and have everything work? Well, when you watch those shows on the tiny house things, they, a lot of times they're going to have a, a composting toilet. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and people will look at the composting toilet, and half of them are saying, Ugh. the other half, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Let's say it's not a composting toilet. It's just like the traditional house, cup, right? You're yeah. hooked up. You are adding, um, well, you're adding crap into the, to the system. When you add in tiny houses, you're going to, to have a tiny house here and next to it and next to it, and, and you start adding the amount of people that are adding to that system on a daily basis. Somebody has to account for that. Yeah. Somebody has to account for that. And the system was built, the system, the, the wastewater piping and the wastewater treatment plant were all built upon an infrastructure long, long before we started talking tiny homes and, and getting everybody closer together. So you're already having to account for adding that Ohana unit in the back of the, in the, back of the lot. Um, th th that is an increased burden on the system that needs to be permitted. That's the important part. You're, you're saying you want to do something. You can go back to the utility and say, hey, are you ready to take on my stuff right now? Because I'm going to add all this. You know, if, if it doesn't, it starts to back up and we have a lot bigger problem. Very much correlated to, uh, on the electrical side, too can't just go to the utility and say, hey, I'm ready to drop this load. Now, in a tiny house, you're, you're a little load, and it's, it's going to be more manageable. You'll, you'll likely catch less from them as you will the wastewater side. Mm -hmm. um, it is very important to have those. If everybody started adding these systems, uh, fire protection is another one, um, on their own without going through that process, you can create unsafe situations, not only for yourself, but for the community as right. a whole. And that's where it can become a little bit more of a, a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, the permitting process is important. I'm, I'm not sure of all the regulations that some people have issues with or what they don't have issues with, but, but they are there for a reason. Some of them, um, I'm not, uh, some are great reasons, some maybe less, but uh, they are there for a reason. So to, to basically try and simplify, 
the more impact your your construction, your your dwelling, your your whatever you're building has on <clears throat> external infrastructure, the grid, the wastewater treatment, the storm drain system, the uh, what whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that adds complexity to the overall urban planning or whatever. So when we go back to talking about tiny homes or small um, communities, and especially communities that are already like on water catchment, you know, there and you know, and maybe um, um, septic tanks or something, rather than being attached to a sewer system or a county sewer line, you know, you can start checking those off in the permitting phase and say, well, I'm I'm not impacting the the water from the county because I don't use county water, mm -hmm. and I'm not impacting the sewer system because I'm not on county sewer, and I'm not impacting Eco Helco Miko whoever because I'm going to be using my own electricity. Um, maybe I am impacting the fire department. Can they get to my house because the road's not wide enough? Um, can is there a bridge before my house that won't support a fire truck or an ambulance or a police car or things like that? So, so basically, though, what I guess I'm getting at is the simpler your structure, the simpler your community, um, and the more of those things you take into account, we probably could customize some of the permitting where it could be fairly simple for. Um, a community, especially of tiny homes or off-the-grid homes, mm -hmm. to get permitted and maybe be permitted as a group. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, absolutely. If you were to go in and say, instead of I'm just going to build one house here, I'm going to make a, a system of tiny houses, but I'm going to build it and design it in a way that I'm going to release the burden on the other utilities, it'll be easier to permit. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy because now you added a, you added a level of engineering to that system. Now, electrically, we can make it go off the grid. We can grid tie it and add an energy storage device so that you could you could still receive power from the grid, but it's it's going to be less of a burden on the utility. I think we'll get into that uh, not today, but maybe maybe next time sure. we can talk about how that works. Um, wastewater. If you if you all want to um, in that community be on a composting tour, that's that's going to shift the amount of permitting you have to do. You can't just add a, add a cesspool anymore. That's why I just changed. I think it was last month uh, that cesspools are won't be allowed. I, I could be off on that, but no, um, I remember there was a so, like a grandfather piece about bringing in old septic systems mm -hmm. and people had to upgrade. So you you might want to say, and to kind of tie into that a little bit, why can't I just build a cesspool? Because I'm not burdening that system. Well, in a way, you are burdening the overall system of that of, of Hawaii, that um, a cesspool will, will basically just put everything into the ground, and then the ground deals with it. Well, the, the ground is part of the our overall system as well. So the groundwater is, is feeding back into that wastewater plant, or, or we're using that to... Uh, to clean up and provide water for everybody else. So if you're going to make that worse, then you are impacting the system. Mm -hmm. So it, you can make it easier. Um, I don't know exactly how. I think it's neat that uh, the idea could be there for how, how can we build larger communities that, mm -hmm. that are have a reduced impact on uh, the overall system to ease the permitting of it. Theoretically, yeah. So most of these considerations we've talked about so far are pretty much county building permit um, issues. Um, but then we have state issues and even federal uh, regulations, uh, environmental protection regulations, maybe even um, um, like for some of the stuff we've done, FAA will have us do a glare study to make sure the PV array we're putting out doesn't blind pilots when they're trying to fly an approach or things like that. So what are, what are some of the less typical ones that, that may impact a residential work that are kind of on that state and federal level? Can you think of any besides the... The glare study, or um, oh, man. like, uh, well, for example, and I know this isn't your expertise, but um, uh, an environmental assessment versus an, an environmental study, um, the timelines and things. I know you probably worked on some projects, but you know we've we've gotten into some traps here in Hawaii where we think that an environmental assessment, which is a fairly short process, can be done because there's already similar stuff going on around that they can go, yeah, well, they're doing it and they're doing it and it's okay, so it, we ought to be okay too because we're doing the same thing. Um, and then find out that the EPA goes, no, you need to do a whole environmental assessment thing. Yeah, you did a whole study, cradle to grave, you know, what you're doing. Um, 
those can add a lot of money and a lot of time to your projects. In fact, one of the things, the reasons I wanted to talk about permitting is, um, you know, I've done construction for 25 or 30 years here, mostly when I was younger. And we were at a point then where you could literally take a, if you're just like adding to your house, adding a few feet to your house or something, you just take in a piece of paper with a sketch on it to the building uh, department in the county and, and sit down with a building inspector and he'd make some recommendations and changes and sometimes you could do them right there. Sometimes you had to go home and, and redraw the drawings and put things in and bring them back a couple of days later. But we could get a permit, you know, to build something in a, in a couple of days or a week. And it's like, seems like nowadays you just can't do that. You know, why, why has the permitting gotten so cumbersome? It, it becomes, when it wasn't as big of an impact on the overall system, it was easier to handle. Now, as we start to, to throw in high rises, Mm. Every few blocks, we start changing dramatically that system all the time. So it's there is a level of programming, citywide, countywide, statewide, that has to take into place. But at the same time, the the funding support that we typically give those is not relative. I, I okay. would I would guess that those are probably related. Okay. Yeah, I think that uh, that probably hit it right on the head because, um, for example, right now we're kind of going through a building boom in Kaka'ako. We've got the, the state bird, the, the, the uh, tower crane out there, you know, lifting concrete all <laughs> the over the place. Crane. And um, it, it's getting kind of wild out there. But, you know, we've got 2.7 unemployment rate in the state, and that's mostly because of the construction going on. There's a lot going on. And so getting a building permit from the county now can be a real challenge, even for a small project, because a lot of their inspectors and a lot of their folks are, are out busy working mm -hmm. a lot of other projects but they don't fund more inspectors or, you know, because that's cost yep. and you can't do that. Well, believe it or not, we're, we're pretty much plumb out of time and uh, I'd like to thank Ryan Wubbins from Burns and McDonald from coming down again and we'll see him in about a month because I'm gonna have him on regularly and we'll talk some more about solar, I think. We'll, we'll try and get more into the solar um, discussion on the next show. So thanks for joining us, Stan the Energy Man. Thanks to Cindy and to Ray here in the studio for putting us together on Think Tech Hawaii. And we'll see you next week. Aloha.